One of the daughters of President Muhammadu Buhari is in self-isolation after returning from a visit to the United Kingdom, and that's according to Aisha, the wife of the president. Over the past few weeks, a lot of other highly placed individuals across the world have been forced to go through the same routine as the clarion call for global response to the coronavirus challenge gathers steam. Social distancing in this struggle, which promises no immediate end in sight, is being described as possibly the surest platform for managing the spread of coronavirus in Nigeria. To help us underscore this fact, we are now being joined here by Dr. Kunle Onokoya, orthopedic surgeon and chief medical director, Lagoon Hospitals, Lagos. He is the head of the COVID-19 emergency response team. Welcome to the program, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Dr. Onokoya, welcome to the uh, morning show, and thank you for joining us. Well, you had uh, Tundo introducing uh, the program, and today we're doing uh, social distancing going forward as a way of further informing uh, and educating uh, the public. But what is social distancing? Um, because many Nigerians do not seem to understand what it means. Um, and what is uh, self-isolation? What does it mean? Real times, if you could help us shed some light on this. That's the reality of these times, isn't it? Social distancing simply means keeping, as, keeping a safe distance between yourself and the next person based on how we know this virus behaves. And the current advice is to stay about two meters away. Uh, and because it is spread by droplet infection and not aerosol, it is believed, and that's what the evidence says, that if you are at least two meters away from the next person, then you are safe. So that simply is what social distance is. Self-isolation is like a self-imposed quarantine. is you removing yourself from direct contact with people just because uh, you are at risk or you have probably come in contact. There are some indications for self-indication. I think currently CDC advice says if you have been on any of the flights or from any of the 13 countries that were recently announced, or if you think you might have been in contact with anyone who had been from those countries, then you should self-isolate. Thank you, sir. Now, I would, I would like you to address a particular incident that I was told of. Somebody who just arrived in Nigeria claims that because the flight was near empty, there were only four other people in the cabin. There's no need for self-isolation. In view of the fact that um, the wife of the president has taken pains to inform us that her daughter is self-isolating, I think trying to show a good example, what do you make of those cases of people who deem themselves as an exception to that rule? Well, I think the first thing is to say that what the First Lady has done is commendable because at that level, it, it one, shows that no one is spared, no one is immune from being at risk of this disease. And it also lays the example of what self-isolation should be. Uh, I think those people are probably wrong. If you have been in the enclosed environment of an aircraft, then you should self-isolate. Yes, airplanes, uh, by reason of all people being in one enclosed space, do take measures to freshen the air and recirculate and all that. But current science tells us that if you have been on such a flight, then you should self-isolate. In the last 24 hours, Dr. Onokoya, the uh, talk has been about uh, possible cure for coronavirus, and we had this dramatic moment in which the President of the United States, President Donald Trump, announced that uh, chloroquine phosphate um, is the uh, thing that has been found to be the most effective uh, uh, treatment for coronavirus, where the Food and uh, Drug Administration Agency of the United States, um, the director uh, was not so straightforward. He said, well, they're still testing they're still investigating. Is Donald Trump the right person to announce a cure? That's one. Two, uh, in Nigeria here, or in Africa generally, we've also heard that if you gargle with uh, salt water or with uh, alcohol or you bath yourself with uh, anointing oil, and uh, some of these churches have come up with all kinds of brands of uh, anointing oil, that that may be uh, a solution. What's your reaction to all of this? 
is chloroquine, the cure, and with uh, anointing oil or hot water or salt and water, you know, help. Well, these are unusual times. Certainly, uh, I think the whole issue of chloroquine first came up about earlier this week when the Minister of Health for France did uh, suggest that chloroquine might be useful. I think the announcement from the White House was probably hasty uh, because there hasn't been enough test to confirm that this is the case. Uh, but again, one has to realize the pressure that is there to find a cure. Currently, there is no known cure. Uh, there are various remedies to keep the systems of the body going. But as, as of today, there is no known cure. Uh, I think also one has to make a case for us all being responsible in what we post on social media. Uh, I think we are probably too hasty to spread this news. Yes, I've seen some posts about hot water, about salt water, about this and about that. Uh, certainly, as of now, there is no known cure. Uh, people will want to believe that there is one, and I think that is why all these supposed remedies quickly catch the fancy. But if there is one statement one can make in summary, as of now, there is no known cure for COVID-19. Doctor, now as the head of the emergency response team for COVID-19, can you take us through the protocols and your equipment that you have? Because there's a concern that Nigeria is ill-equipped to manage a pandemic of this scale. Well, no one is equipped to handle a pandemic of this case, of this nature. And I mean, we've seen countries in Europe, we've seen the United States all struggle to make sure that they have enough ICU beds, to make sure that they have enough ventilators. So no one is prepared to handle an emergency of this case, of this magnitude. So I will not necessarily put Nigeria down and say we are unpre unprepared. I think there is a lot of effort that is going on behind the scenes to make sure we are as prepared as possible. I can say it for certain that the state has reached out to us with regards to a census of how many ICU beds there are, how many ventilators there are. So there's quite a lot that is going on. I think the entire world is playing catch up with this disease. Having said that, we as a hospital, we have a duty of care to our staff to our patients, to our corporate clients, to anyone that walks through our doors. So we have been putting processes and protocols in place. What happens if someone who is at risk shows up? How do we screen them? How do we confirm that diagnosis? What happens if somebody who is ill shows up? What should be the protocols in place? We've tried to deploy those protocols. We've tested and retested and retested them just to make sure they work. We've had to fine-tune them. We've sent mystery shoppers round to all our facilities. Uh, the other day, I sent somebody to, down to one of our facilities claiming he was on one of those flights and he has a cough. It's a bit difficult to feign a fever because that could quickly be checked. But again, what we've been doing is to make sure that we have a system that is as robust as possible but that is also as flexible as possible to respond. We think, well, we are trying to prepare for the worst, even while hoping for the best. Uh, what the pattern in other countries tell us is that the storm is probably about to erupt. That is if it hasn't landed yet. So we are just trying to be ready as much as possible. We are lucky that is in Lagoon Hospitals because we have a very, very, I mean, at the risk of being immodest, probably the best ICU there is in the land. We have ventilators. But again, as I said, no one is prepared for a condition of this magnitude. Uh, it's very good that uh, you cited the example of your own hospital, Lagoon Hospitals. Uh, we've had uh, some other doctors on this program much earlier. Uh, who also spoke about this uh, uh, coronavirus uh, pestilence. And they were concerned that the federal government or the state government is not reaching out enough to private hospitals, that there has been too much concentration on uh, public hospitals, whereas most people seeking help will go to private hospitals. What are your thoughts on this? Do you see enough 
uh, you know, uh, uh, attempt on the part of government to involve the private uh, hospitals in this battle, or rather, this war against coronavirus. War, indeed. But as I did say earlier, we, the state government had reached out to us with regards to a census of the ICU beds that are in the state, the number of ventilators that are in the state. So I think all that work is going on. It, it's not necessarily out in the public space, but that work is going on. Uh, we work very closely with the Lagos State response effort. I was on the phone with the state epidemiologist only yesterday night, and we are just trying to make sure that we are in sync with what the state government is doing. So I don't think the effort is necessarily concentrated alone on the public hospitals. Where I think more could be done is for, I mean, Nigeria is not just about Lagos and Abuja and Port Harcourt. For the vast majority of our fellow citizens, their first point of contact for health care might be at the local pharmacist, might be at the local chemist, might be at the primary health center next to them. So I think we should be reaching out to all these points with regards to what protocol should be, what education we want to be out there, what the initial response should be. Because, I mean, frankly speaking, that is where most people are going to show up first. Yes, some will present at Lagoon Hospital, some will present at the other bigger hospitals in the city, but we also have a response that cuts across board so that wherever it is you present, either because you are ill or because you are anxious, you might have been exposed, there is adequate information available. There is some first responder type uh, activity that you can then plug into. I think that is probably where we are still lagging. Yes, the response is concentrated. It needs to be a bit more diverse, irrespective of where people show up. For pointing out those potential loopholes, but you said earlier that a storm is going to erupt, that is, if it hasn't already landed. Can you clarify that statement? Is that a reference to the number of cases? Because there's no country in the world that's doing mass testing. Nobody really knows, has a proper handle on the figures. Well, I wasn't suggesting mass testing. Uh, for most countries, they, I don't think there's any country that is doing mass testing screening, as it were. Uh, people, countries are only screening people who have been at risk or people who have shown symptoms. I know that currently in Lagos State, uh, they will monitor people who are at risk, but then screen those who show symptoms. But when I say that the storm is about to erupt, that's if it hasn't landed, it's just referencing what we already know about how this disease behaves. And, I mean... Just a couple of days ago, Italy announced that overnight they had 475 mortalities. That was a huge rise. I believe it was something about 40% based on the previous day. So we do see that suddenly the uh, number of infected cases ramp up dramatically. And if you are not careful, then you'll be struggling to pay catch up with your systems. And now that we still have relatively few numbers... I think as of now, the total number announced has been positive is 12. Now is the time to get the response systems ready. Is the time to perfect when we begin to have the large numbers. Because really, I mean, I'm not a prophet of doom. But certainly the science tells us, the experience in other countries tells us that those numbers could rise significantly. And we need to be ready. Well... Very good point, Dr. Onokoya. But at this point, we'll take a short commercial break. When we return, the conversation will continue. Please stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Still with us in our Lagos studio. We're not right here with us in this room because of social distancing. This is Dr. Kunle Onokoya, orthopedic surgeon, chief medical director, Lagoon Hospitals, Lagos, and head of the COVID-19 emergency response team in Lagos. Now, Dr. Onoka, I would like to take you back to some of the points you made. Uh, you talked about science and experience, showing that although in Nigeria we have just 12 cases, that the, the numbers can just escalate. Now, what's the possible worst-case scenario 
can we suddenly find ourselves in a situation whereby we become the epicenter of coronavirus in Africa, given our population? And should that happen? Do we have the capacity? I know earlier on you had said, oh, OK, you don't want to put down Nigeria. Uh, structures are being put in place. But in the case of a worst case scenario, what should we expect? Can we handle it? And uh, where can we seek for help? Well, again, I think we can draw knowledge from what science tells us and what other countries have experienced. Uh, the experience in virtually every other country where this has, the infection has reached large numbers is that there is a lot of pressure on the health systems. No country has had enough ICU beds because this condition primarily attacks the respiratory system, the lungs. So people very, very quickly, about 10% of those who are infected, become unable to breathe themselves, so they need support. That means they need to be in an intensive care unit. And countries are finding out that they don't have enough intensive care unit beds, they don't have enough ICU beds, and they don't have enough ventilators, that is enough life support systems. In fact, I think the health secretary in the UK was on air earlier on in the week to say, look, if anybody makes ventilators, we will buy them. Uh, so it's a bit late in the day for us now to be looking to buy ventilators or to be looking to create ICU beds because these things don't exist on the shelf, which is why things like promoting social distancing, emphasizing the importance of hand washing, using sanitizers to as much as possible limit the number of people who get infected. Uh, see, it's a very, very prudent thing to do. I mean, if President Trump went on air to say, we don't have enough ICU beds, then you can begin to understand where we will be if the condition becomes a full-blown crisis. Thank you, Doctor. Now, my question that I asked you earlier was not comparative, and it was not critical of Nigeria. I asked if Nigeria is prepared because we are Nigerians in Nigeria. As you have said, quite rightly, there's no organization in the world that's prepared or no health system that's prepared or not overwhelmed by this crisis. We've seen the developed world, as we've, we like to call it, brought to its knees by COVID-19. What is the best use of this crisis? I asked that of our previous guest from an economic point of view. I'm asking you from a medical point of view. And what do we learn about the fact, unfortunately, that this is a recurrent issue? We have in America the unfortunate example of President Donald Trump disbanding in 2018 the, U the United States pandemic response team that was set up by Obama in his customary behavior of taking a torch to everything the Obama administration did. And now that has now come back to haunt this current administration. As a personal confession on my own, I got a few um, thermometers, you know, those remote ones you scan people's temperatures when the Ebola crisis broke out. And after the Ebola crisis was over, one of my children decided to use it as a toy. And now we need more thermometers. So what do we learn from this going forward? And how do we best respond? Well, I think one of the things we've learned is that you need to... These things now seem to be occurring, in like, every couple of years. In the last six to eight years, we've had a major pandemic, pandemic every couple of years. So is that the new normal? I don't know. But I think that health systems and Nigeria should not be an exception to this. Should have an emergency response system that you can crank up, you can deploy and crank up very quickly. The measures you put in place once the condition is there, once the pandemic is full blown, are frankly speaking not sustainable. Over a short period of time, yes, but not sustainable on the long run. So you just have to be ready and prepared for what the next one is going to be. I wasn't just defending for defendant's sake. But I think, as, uh, even though, yes, the system was caught on awares, I think particularly Lagos State has ramped up very quickly. Um, I know quite a bit about their emergency operation center and what they've done with regards to contact tracing, with regards to testing and all. 
it will have been good if this kind of thing, these systems could be deployed, you know, at the snap of a finger rather than the few days lag time that you have. But again, that is what we have. What have we learned from it? I think as health systems, it is good if access is wider, if access is broader. I think what we are seeing comparing Europe and the United States is that testing was far easier to ramp up quickly in Europe because it's a state-funded healthcare system, as opposed to in the States where uh, you are pretty much on your own if you don't have health insurance. So I think one of the things we also need to learn is to make sure that the vast majority of our people have access to health care, not just because there might be a pandemic, but because that's the proper thing to do. And when there is then a pandemic, then there is already a system in existence that funnels them appropriately into where, the, uh, the, where health care can then be accessed. I think that is what we have learned, and that is what we should spend time and effort doing going forward. Well, uh, um, Dr. Nokoya, we'll be back to you in a second. We have uh, breaking news. After that breaking news, our conversation with you will continue. And here is the breaking news. A former senator representing by SIE Senatorial District, Ben Murray Bruce, has lost his wife to cancer. She was 43. The senator just made this disclosure through his verified Twitter handle. Our condolences to Senator Ben Murray Bruce and the entire Murray Bruce family. Now, Dr. Uh, Onokaya, sorry about that uh, bad news, with which, uh, you know, uh, you know, we interrupted the conversation, but now uh, we're back uh, to you. Now, you've been very diplomatic. You said you are not defending the Nigerian government. And indeed, the Nigerian government has done a lot. The various states also responded the moment the number of cases rose to about eight. And today we have uh, 12 cases. But I want you to just do an objective assessment of the response uh, by Nigeria so far. And to just draw our attention, point out 13 other steps that can be taken beyond restricting flights, beyond shutting down all schools, beyond stopping the National Sports Festival, beyond stopping uh, the uh, football competitions across the country. What else do you think that uh, government needs to do in terms of sensitizing and mobilizing the Nigerian people to know that, look, we face a very serious crisis? Because Personally, I see some kind of distance still between government making efforts and the people trying to understand that this is a serious problem. Well, I think the first thing I would like to say is, again, uh, our feelings and prayers go to the Murray Bruce family for the news that just broke. Uh, I wasn't trying to be diplomatic, really. Those are just the facts. It's, uh, yes, you might say that some of those efforts are not out there in the public domain, but from the bit of a vantage point where I sit, I see some of those efforts. Yes, I think probably, probably the greatest risk we face as a people is because, one, vast uh, swathes of our people and society are in denial. People are thinking that, well, it's not, um, it's not my portion. I reject it. It cannot come here. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Yes, all those things are good. But you still need to practice what science is telling us we need to do. So I think one is people are probably not taking this serious enough because of all these other coping mechanisms that we have. I think also that government can do a, a lot more in focusing our attention as a society on this problem. Yes, it is good that the um, Edo State... Um, the sports event that was coming up has been at least cancelled for now. But the average market in Lagos contains more people than will ever come to that national sports uh, festival. And nothing is being done about them. And nobody knows. They certainly don't have any information as to social distancing, as to this disease that is coming. So you can imagine the level of information they have. I think that is where government needs to concentrate. At every level of government, everybody needs to have information about what the risks are, how to stay safe, what places to avoid. 
it's okay to say you shouldn't go to uh, religious gatherings where there are more than 50 people, absolutely fine. But nobody has said anything about whether I should go to the market or not, about whether I should go to a shopping mall or not. Are there risks there? If there are, what should I be doing? And we will then have to find out if the disease ramps up suddenly, then there's going to be panic because people have not been prepared before um, that ramping up comes. So I think, yes, there is much more the government could do, particularly with regards to preparing the populace. Now that things are still a bit more sedate, I think there's a lot that could be done. Um, one area, and I did give that example, is the markets, is the people are going into mass transit, public mass transit systems, and nobody is telling them what the risks are and what precautions should be taken. I think uh, those are the kind of areas where the government should play. Thank you for that excellent point, because some direction is needed. Do you foresee a time where we'll have to implement a total shutdown as opposed to the partial one you've just described? I mean, I don't speak for government. I don't make policy. But I think one of the things we should also do is take knowledge and draw experience from what is happening in other countries. If that is anything to go by, then we too will get to a point where we will need to consider social restrictions. Restrictions with regards to gatherings, yes, but even taking that a step further and restrictions to movement. That is simply what, uh, looking at how other societies have coped, I think that is going to come. Thank you very much, Dr. Onokoya. Thank, Thank you. you very much. This has been quite educative.